So hi, my name's Michael Richardson, um, and uh, uh, well, I'll t tell you what, just just tell me your name as we go by. Hi, I'm Moisai. Best to you. Gérald Martinez. Dave Rice. And we have a, a few other people that regularly join us, which I don't see online or uh, here. Um, so um, I'm what we what, what you've joined us is now is our monthly meeting, which normally would be Tuesday at 9 p.m. Um, uh, at the last Tuesday of the month, and we've moved it from Tuesday of this week to Friday at this time. Um, so this is in some way a bit of a performance theater, if you like. Uh, uh, for what we're going to do. Um, and so to, ITF sessions are generally quite uh, interactive. Um, so, you know, please interrupt. And um, this is a, a, a working group session in that sense. So you, uh, what we're going to do, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the IETF and what the work itself. Um, and I said normally it would be longer because we thought we had a half an hour, but no, we don't. We get more time than that. Um, most of the work in the IETF happens by email. Um, it, the IETF itself started around 1987. I'll come back to that. Um, and we have we now have this sophisticated tool called Meet Echo, um, which you are seeing now, which is used by five or six other conferences, and it's a uh, it's not Zoom. As I can tell you, it, it's it's very heavily, heavily, heavily customized for our hybrid and fully online meetings, um, and uh, uh, you can you can use it too. You could have used it for this one, um, uh, but it is it is is actually extremely high uh, designed for having rooms full of people and then some people who are uh, goals to get you involved. So who is the IETF? So I put a kid on a couple of, of things. This is what my mother thinks I do, right? Which is run around and do weird, you know, stuff in a mask or some security stuff. Uh, my friends think it involves a lot of cables and stuff like this. And um, they're partly right, but mostly wrong. Um, what I think it is, is that we're designing some new beautiful architecture for the future involving, you know, something there. Um, in, in, in practice, uh, my experience is it's it's mostly arguments, um, and when they go badly, they they work out like um, friends where no one quite listened to each other, and we were on a break, and we should have split up or something like that. So the ITF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, and um, oh yeah, one more slide here. What I tell my dentist, right? Um, so um, you know that thing in your browser that says HTTP. Yeah, that's our protocol. We designed that in the 1990s, and it wasn't our first protocol. And there's a whole bunch of other other layers there. Um, and uh, um, the layer is everything below that point um, down to the just above the physical layer. So we don't design connectors and we don't design electrical systems. Um, but from that layer all the way up and above us, HTML, the, the thing we heard this morning about the problems with uh, the uh, browser, uh, what was it called? The, the Ukraine thing where the browser and the infinite scroll, and if you have a robot, it can't go by. Well, that's not our problem. That's an HTML JavaScript problem. There's another organ standards organization above us that deals with that, and I don't do that. Um, so, well, I don't personally do any of that stuff. I'm involved mostly in in network security stuff. And I was actually brought in to co-chair this working group with these fine gentlemen, because apparently I know something about how to get the document through the process. And um, that's a little bit of a arcane knowledge. And anyone who works in a government department understands that, you know, getting your document or your policy up through the right approvals is, you know, a job in itself. Um, but I have met all those people that have done those things and uh, we're, a, relatively small, very open community. And the if you have some interest in somehow getting involved in HTTP or QUIC or DNS or anything like this, you can do it for essentially no cost. Uh, we don't have a membership. We're a meritocracy. Um, we don't often know who's enfranchised and we have a complicated process as a result. So we don't have votes because we don't have everyone in the whole planet's enfranchised and we don't know who we would count. 
Um, so as I said, we also do all these other things, um, which you've probably heard of. Um, and um, IPsec is the, for instance, the thing that I have worked on for 25 years has nothing to do with, with this uh, effort here. Um, so we did this codec called Opus in the early 2010s. Um, and we did it because all the other codecs and voice codecs had terrible IPR issues and the people that were building um, SIP and WebRTC based systems wanted a code, uh, something that would be decent and wouldn't be plagued with IPR claims left, right and center. And for the, as a result of that good work, um, as I understand it, um, the AV community came to the IETF and said, we'd really like to standardize what is essentially Matroska. And it was formed in 2015. And when did I join? 2018? Yeah, it's Terry. So basically there was a fellow from Mozilla who was overworked and they needed some help. So this working group, we published RFC 7894, which is EBML, Extended Binary Markup Language. Um, it's a little bit like an XML without all the insanity. Um, and we published that in 2020. Um, and we published FFV1 uh, for version 0, 1, and 3, if I got that right, um, in August of 2021. Um, and the Matroska document, which is, of course, an instance of EBML. Um, well, I think we're pretty close, right, guys? So um, there. Um, almost all of our meetings. So while the IETF meets three times a year, even in pandemic, we still had three one-week online plenary sessions, even though it would have made more sense to have it differently. Um, and so we have a meeting in a week and a half in London. Um, and uh, that'll be our third meeting back from uh, pandemic. Um, but this group meets only as what we call virtual interims. So that means they're completely online. We use this tool that you're seeing now. Um, and uh, they're mostly working group sessions. We try to avoid slideware as you're seeing now. Um, anyone can join. There are no fees, there's no membership, um, and it really is a meritocracy. Say smart things and we'll listen to you. Um, if you're rude or violate our code and conduct, there may be sanctions. And we have a 500 email long debate going on right now about one historic core contributor who has been an asshole. And, uh, we're basically kicking him out and people are arguing over whether that's a good thing or not. Um, so we, we, we finally tr started to take our code of conduct seriously. And that's probably a good thing. Um, so working group itself, that may be a little bit small to see, maybe even on the big board. Um, so this is our, our data tracker. Um, this is also a bespoke application, open source. You could implement it yourself for your own group if you like, but again, it does what we need. Um, and this is a view of the documents that are in our working group. Um, so you can go to datatracker.ietf.org um, for IPR reasons. Um, you often need a, to log in, and that's not because we're afraid of our intellectual property being stolen, but because if you contribute something and it turns out that what you contributed, you had intellectual property right, claims on, then that gets us in trouble. In other words, you wind up being in a position to sue the other people. And so we want to be sure that if you contributed something that we know who contributed it. That's the only reason we have a log, and they're available for anyone. Um, we do a lot of our work on GitHub, so um, these guys have, whatever, 400 some open issues at times, and uh, we try to work through them, figure out which ones are important, and close the ones that, uh, with pull requests that matter. Um, and finally, uh, there's a mailing list, and that's an image of the archive of it. So. Without logging in or doing anything else, you could follow the mailing list. You can follow the meetings on YouTube um, if you want to. Um, but if you want to contribute again, we sort of just need to know who you are, or our lawyers need to know. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned about the lawyers. So one of the things is, is by participating in the IETF, you agree to the IETF processes and policies. And if you have something to contribute and you do contribute it, and you say something, then and it turns out that you have a patent on it, then we just want you to tell us. That's all we want to know. So maybe we'll avoid your technology. 
is it? So the obligatory has to put this up. Um, some URLs. Um, and I mentioned them all. And I said, if you like, you could go visit them on your laptop or this kind of stuff. And I'm going to end this part of the presentation here. So you may have seen Etherpad, and then it got renamed, and then it got renamed. Now it's called PitchDoc. So this is what we do. We wind up sharing a common uh, thing. Uh, we and everyone else, all of NTW, I guess, right? So uh, among the group up here, did you read the minutes from last time? I guess not, since I apparently didn't post them no, until didn't. 10 minutes ago. So I thought they were automatically posted when I posted them to the system. So I guess we won't do this part here. You know, uh, no, uh, we'll do have to do that next time. So, okay. Um, overall status: Matroska was updated. I think was we're past eleven. I thought, aren't we, Steve? Yes, I use sense. Anyone else used HedgeDoc or Etherpad to have a meetings online collaboratively create things? Yeah, so it's basically just a big editor and you can fight over who gets to type what. Okay, and the other cool thing is that someone's taking notes and writing along and spells something wrong and someone else corrects you and fixes your fixes the uh, name of the of the uh, person whose name you got wrong. So what was it we posted? So the, yeah, I posted version 14. 14. The first of October. Right. Okay. It says submitted to AESG for publication. Okay. Right. So when we thought we had less time, I was going to, more time, I was going to do a diagram um, of what this means. So um, submitted to IESG for publication. So the way that the IETF is architected is that so. We have all of us who are working and contributing. Uh, me, who's the co-chair of the working group, and then I report to an area director who is in charge of the whole area. And there are 13 or 14 of them, and they are supposed to be the managers of the organization. None of us get paid uh, by the ITF. We're all, all of our employers have volunteered our time. And my manager, the AD, the joke was it's a 50% commitment of his time, but it's a 50% of an 80 hour work week. So it's a bit of a joke, but it's become a full time job, unfortunately. So now we've asked him, it says, We're ready. Our document is ready. Would you please review it? And if it's okay, then you'll advance it to the next thing, next level. And then what will happen is that those other 14 people will review it. And then we'll get a series of comments and discusses, and it works by rough consensus, which is not the same as the Quaker system of consensus, but um, is similar. So um, you can have objections, but you can't have too many. Well, that's what the point is. Um, so we're going to do that next, um, and that will be the next step for that thing. Um, a question. Yeah. Uh, so on the status page, it's, it says AD evaluations. It says it's supposed to be there 14 days. Yeah. And then action holder, so Murray, 21 days. It's supposed to be. Yeah. So we're not making our service level agreements, are we? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to apologize yeah. for Murray. It's, it's a 200 page document. It's a 200 page document, but, um, and also his, his, uh, Co AD has just returned from maternity leave a week ago. So he's been holding the fort down for two people for about four months. So I imagine he will catch up in the next couple of weeks. And I hope that we will be in uh, at the IESGQ by Christmas, perhaps earlier. Depends on how many comments he has. So it is a 200 page document, um, which you can review. 150 pages of it are what element descriptions, right? Uh, so, yes, and a lot of it is also in the BML RFC, which is 50 pages. So they have to know that before they start doing the Matroska. That's true, but he's already reviewed that one, so he should be okay with that. He published it there. Okay, so um, 
milestone review. Okay, so one of our other documents is this FLAC system, and Jerome was talking this morning about, uh, well, I noticed that, yeah, EVML, FLAC, and, you know, as and what Troska is your container, your single file container for uh, the, what was it called? Uh, raw raw cook. Yeah, there you go, raw cook. So that's an implementation of our spec, exactly. essentially, right? And so that's really cool to we, hear about. We have Matroska for the container part, uh, FFG1 for video part, and the flag for the audio part, and everything inside that is for lossless context. So the first two are RFCs already, which I mentioned earlier, and then FLAC is work in progress. And so we did not make our July 2022 milestone. Um, and what do you think? Well, we uh, had a working group last call. Uh, it's almost ended. Uh, we've had a lot of comments and they've all been processed. So I guess the next step is to uh, wait for writer. Okay. So, so, so um, they've been processed, but you haven't posted the revision. The revision. You did repost it. Okay. So that's cool. So that's um, that's what's just updating. So revised document. So, but I didn't. Uh, I don't remember seeing the revised document. But it would be interesting. Posted. Okay, so uh, ready for Shepard write up. So that's good. So we didn't make it by July, but we made it by October. So that's a really good capital. Um, do you want to summarize any any major changes that you want to talk about? Well, Black at some point uh, was developed in 2001, and it's one other wrote a nice document about how Flux is supposed to work, uh, or how Flux is structured, uh, but a lot of details were missing. So currently, we have a document where all the details. Uh, should be uh, it should by now be a document where you don't have to look at the source code and the flag implementations it's around this document became i think four times as large as it was in the first place um so it's come a long way a lot of people have uh, you know, have been involved in uh, reading it and uh, finding themes they would like to have uh, explained better. I'll just mention Mark. I said your name wrong again, but Mark, Mark Tin, Mark, Mark Tyne. Yeah, Mark Tyne um, has basically jumped into this in what, spring of this year? Yeah, so basically jumped in pretty late and took over this and were extremely help pleased about this. And I don't think he'd been involved in the ITF at all ever before. Right. So, um, really cool, and you know, we can get next month. Um, it's a small working group. Some working groups have three hundred members, and um, process ten documents at the same time. But I was just um, and we need people to read the documents, right? And and particularly if you read the document and you say, "I don't understand something," it is so useful. It's terribly useful. Or this sentence is nonsense. The way you can say uh, that—that's really, really useful to us to know. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to move on to Matroska. So we just learned that it's submitted to the ISG for publication. Um, were there any other things that we needed to talk about that might still be open? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, we just merged a, a request to add a track one codec, codec, codec to the codec specification, but for now we're not working with that one. It's right. so like really on topic for this conference because they try to get a track one uh, from. So, 
this right right sony discs yeah yeah right to actually be able to read the content uh, with a fmpeg and have a way a sustainable way to keep the files for the with the old read with the original codec so we have a separate document um you could implement Vitroska without any codecs bizarre but it might be interesting if all you cared about was say showing what the the uh, you had a player that simply wanted to show you what the chapters of the movie were right that would be a possibility we never need to decode the codex because you're never playing the content but you could tell people you know this is the parts of the movie or the other thing go ahead yeah, I wanted to say, uh, with this example, it is a big example about how to participate to Matroska. Uh, the people behind the ATVAC uh, codec uh, wanted to have matros uh, mat uh, support in Matroska, and uh, they are not part of the working group, but they come and they say, okay, I need to, to, to have a support for uh, my codec. Um, it, it, it can be bizarre, we don't care actually, which we, we accept any codec from anyone and we reserve uh, a specific codec id for this specific codec so the barrier is not big you just have to write to, to the matroska mailing list saying oh i need something what can we do uh, and can i reserve uh, something for my for me so so the list of codecs though what i was trying to get at to, to I was trying to trying to to come to step slightly back. So the list of codecs is in a separate document. And in that document, we have a list of codecs. And I think we have like 50 of them or around that number. Yeah, in that list. And one of the things in that document is it says that if you have a new codec, you want to uh, have an identity for it, then there's a process by which we ask you to go through and you say, basically just email a, a thing and it'll go into a table and we have a, there's a, a, a eight people in California who keep track of this table. It's just an XML table. And there's a, if, if, if the person who asks follows the right instructions, which in some cases just means, you know, my, my name is Bob, my Kodak is called AT Track one And, you know, the definition of my format is, a, is in this website here. Then you would get an identity would be added for you. And this is what happened for these, these guys who were doing uh, so uh, of disc and disc band. mini disc yes yeah. the only person i ever saw have one was my brother and he only had the only he, all of his mini discs were were labeled walking to school music and then a date and i don't know what i never quite knew song something cool uh, and then his mini disc player you know died so i wanted to cover all this stuff you still need the hardware yeah. All right. So, uh, so that happened, um, and we our next step, I think, is going to be working on the Matroska codec. We need to write the IANA considerations um, for this, which is means we have a whole bunch of different things. I was going to put up a slide, but I thought we would run out of time. Um, there's a whole bunch of of different possibilities from. You have to have an IETF consensus document that's been extensively reviewed and an RFC published, like that's like the highest level. Um, to uh, any document in a stable place will be fine. To, um, you know, uh, I wrote this document with this other standards organization and they did something would be fine, down to this is my name and address and you can contact me here. And then, you know, there's a whole range of different things we have to decide what is it's probably going to be more towards the the lower end of things you know uh for that if someone comes along and proves they are not a a, a uh, spam bot that you know we'll give them a number just have to write that down in the documents see how it works uh said there's no flack issues left that's those were the last time uh and then i guess uh one of the last things because i think we have about five minutes left here do you want to talk about ebml oh yeah okay so let's go to a uh, other business i'll just close this other this other note i was going to say about we have a new version of ffb1 that we are i guess say planning we, we plan yeah. to be start for a month but we and, plan to do it 
And so one of the questions is essentially is, you know, there are some bits and pieces that V3 doesn't do, and we have a V4 conceived, but we don't yet have a, I would say, a, a, a big enough reason to, to step forward. And so you might have some ideas of things you want in a video codec that you could help share with us would be great. Even if you don't want to get the requirements are as good as implementation. Okay, so you go ahead. What, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, you remember for BML, we had some changes. People discover bugs in the specifications and also found some issues as well. So there's like uh, eight errata to add to the document. And uh, we postponed it until Matroska was ready in case we need big changes in the document. And now that my trust guy is in the pipe, we can actually go back to BML, send the errata, and actually find a way to do it. So I will probably do it this weekend. So that's cool. So the RFC, there's a site called the RFC, rfceditor.org, which is the authoritative site for all of the RFCs, all nine and a half thousand of them. And on that website, uh, so the RFCs are immutable which is often very frustrating to people when they find spelling mistakes. Um, we don't reissue them ever. Um, so uh, what we will do is two things, is either you can post an errata, which is what Steve is going to do, and there's actually a way, if it's done in XML, that we can show you the RFC plus the errata, and we'll say to you, but this is not normative, because we can't be sure, you know. Um, and then what will happen is we'll respin and we'll produce a new RFC, with a new number with the errata included, uh, but we probably won't do that for maybe at least a year, uh, just because it would take us that long to get there anyway, after our other documents are done. And uh, yeah, if you find errata or written better, then you can also do that. You can also submit things through the GitHub which is also very useful, but understand the GitHub is totally on the network at this point. Anything else from you guys? Uh, yeah, it's something not exactly related to that, but the whole Matroska specific specification is based on one big XML file that is generating actually the specifications for all the elements in Matroska, and that code is also used in, uh, MKV to Nix, and also in my tools, MK validator and uh, and I regenerated all the code uh, recently since now everything is stable. And uh, so basically, the code matches exactly the spec from now. So what you're telling is we have spec driven code. Yes. That's kind of useful since there's uh, quite a number of elements. Like... And I already did the work to do the same for uh, FMPEG, the Tmuxer, I think. Okay. Uh, it was not much, but I need to update the code. And one of the questions was if the XM should be integrated to XM, uh, the FM code, FMPEG code, or if it should be outside. That's up for discussion, but basically we can do the FMPEG code as well based on the spec. Yeah, um, it raises an interesting XML code too pedantically uh, weird. Um, <clears throat> but uh, thank you for telling us that. So that's good. So anything else from the, the room? Any questions? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Kate Murray from the Library of Congress, and this is a, a, a bit of a super dirty question, but did the proposed media type for Matroska change recently? So was it something else, and now it's going to be video slash Matroska or audio slash Matroska? In previous I, versions, it used to be unofficial because it wasn't registered, so I think it was video slash X dash Matroska. It still exists, but now that, because uh, according to the ITF rules, that kind of uh, name is deprecated. Okay. So we made a new one 
saying also that the, the old one exists, so people know that they may have to support us. But the official one is video slash Microsoft. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And, and actually, it's, it's a bit of a pain in the ass because what we would really like is all of the um, encoders, writers, to start using the new one immediately. But of course, that would be stupid because the players don't don't know about it. So what we actually need is all of the players to start supporting both as there. And then some few years in the future, we need all the encoders to start using ideally the official one. But that's like kind of a pedantic, silly thing. Um, so the reality is that both will be out in the field forever. You know, in, in, when people dig up your archive of video content to, 4500, year 4500, they'll probably still say video slash X Matroska, and that's okay. Sia Radoslav Markov, CMTTC, 10 EN 41 FS. I would like to ask you uh, do you feel a need uh, for uh, uh, extending future proof the essence type in MKV? Because my personal opinion is right now, maybe it's limited uh, number of a uh, limited type of essence do you understand the question no but i think the question is do we want to submit it to smpta no 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 uh this is the second question right now okay, so the answer is no uh, no, I think that you, you anyway need to interact with senti because uh, for any reason no uh, uh, which, question which is uh, question is um in MKV, there is a field which uh, name of the type of the assets, video, we have, uh, audio. We have video, audio, but also over. So uh, it is an informal part saying that everything beginning with V uh, underscore is from video, and everything beginning with A underscore is audio, but we can accept every kind of uh, essence. So, which kind of essence would you like to embed in the media uh, in, in Matroska? Right now, don't know, and that is my question. Is it uh, future proof? It's preview all the kind of uh, essence that can be. Uh, it, it is just a letter. Actually, in Matroska, it, it is very neutral about the kind of uh, essence you have. So, we plan to add a time code, for example, and we will see how we put that uh, in Matroska. But uh, as a container, Matroska is very neutral about the block it transports. Yes, but uh, how we can describe the type of essence? We just have... There is there are two fields. There's the name of the codec, which is a string, so it can be But if we prefer, as I said, the prefix of certain letter. And there's also a track type, which there, it's, a, it's a number. So, for example, one is audio, two is video, three is uh, subtitles, etc. And basically, it's a number on 64 bits. So, you have a lot of possible types. The, the, there's a list of numbers that are already set, and we can add more in the future. That's, that's the IANA considerations that I was talking about. Every single one of those fields has an amending formula. And some of them are complicated uh, or involved, and some of them are trivial, right? Just we have something. And I also said to say that over in the mime type space, in another part of the ITF, going up into the W3C, uh, there is a, you know, so we have audio slash and video slash and application slash and image slash. And all. Uh, so they want to create a haptic hierarchy for things like vibrations and all these other things that are happening in video games that people would like to record, right? Uh, so I guess the next version of whatever, it's uh, whatever Justin TV or whatever the other video game watching things you really enjoy, experience the motion as well as the video. <laughs> Yeah, 64 bits. Yeah. Right now we're on so the new is, is that enough for you? Because I don't want to run out of 64 bits. Dave, did you say you have a question? Um, I I know at this point the, in, in the goals of the working group, there's only a, a couple items left, like the RFC for 
Slack and the task code, which are close to done. I'm just wondering, like, once these RFC XMLs are uploaded, what is next to the working group? Does it get shut down or? Well, um, if we come up with more work that uh, we think we can do, then we uh, can ask to be rechartered with the new work. Um, that's usually well attended. Uh, and the only time it, it doesn't happen is with, you know, someone saying we should do oil this ocean and everyone else is like yeah i'm done i'm going home right um so yeah we, we can exist for as long as there is work to do but what they do like us to do is to to bite off small chunks at a time and say what we're going to do and then do it and then based on that get yeah, otherwise uh the working group um is closed which doesn't mean it disappears it just means we don't necessarily have meetings. We still have a mailing list. We still have a web page. Status of the documents can change. And it's relatively easy to reopen the working group. If someone comes along and says, we need to standardize this new quantum video compression system that someone's invented. Yeah, we can do that. So, anyway. Thank you so much all for sh letting us have this inside view into your into your working group meeting. Thank you for having us.